since I'm the last scheduled speaker, I'd like to invite everyone to join me in thanking the conference organizers in putting on, for putting on such an interesting event. I'd like to try to do a few things during my brief talk. I may well break new ground for this workshop by not giving any examples of deep theorems or deep mathematical results or deep proofs, though I would like to try to give some examples of proofs that are deeper than other proofs without any of them being particularly deep. Some of them, in fact, will be laughably shallow drawn from recreational mathematics. But nothing that's deep in the way that has led a number of people to stretch the lower registers of their voice. So deep <laughs> proofs. Um, but I would like to focus on depth of proofs and not merely the depth of theorems. And I'd also like to talk a bit about an idea that's come up briefly already from time to time, namely the idea of explanation in mathematics or of one proof being deeper than another by virtue of supplying an explanation, uh, roughly an account of why a given theorem holds, supplying understanding or insight. I suppose I'll find myself using those terms more or less synonymously. So Jeremy Gray, for example, mentioned that Gauss wanted to know why only half of the assignable characters correspond to primitive genera in the table of quadratic forms in his example. And Gauss explained the pattern. We asked yesterday whether a theorem that was hard to prove or at one time deeply hidden or at one time unexpected would continue to count as deep after it was no longer hidden or unexpected or even after it was no longer that hard to prove. Well, unlike being hidden or unexpected or hard to prove, all of which reflect our epistemic situation. Uh, a proof that explains why a given theorem holds presumably doesn't stop explaining why the theorem holds even after we've learned more than we knew before. Why a theorem is true presumably doesn't change with our changing epistemic circumstances even though we may ask different why questions in different contexts, and an answer to one why question may well provoke others. Another reason I'd like to look more closely at the relation between mathematical explanation and depth is that it might help us to be reminded that depth is an idea that arises not only in mathematics and chess and art and music, but also in science. For example, one scientific explanation of a given fact, one account of why that fact holds, may be deeper than another. And this may also help us to keep in mind that depth is a matter of degree. So I want to do a little to compare depth in mathematics to depth in science, even though I don't really understand either one of them. I'd also like to look a bit at the relation between depth and explanation and unification. Now this came up just a few minutes ago when we were talking about uh, proofs by cases. So just, just uh, in Alistair's talk, uh, Alistair um, didn't read the passage from Hardy, I'm tempted to say the delicious passage from Hardy, that concerns uh, proof by cases. So I quickly looked it up in the break which is why I was sitting there with my cell phone. Um, Hardy wrote, uh, enumerate, in, in the same book we were talking about, enumeration of cases is one of the duller forms of mathematical <laughs> argument. So it doesn't sound like it's the unreliability of proofs by cases that Hardy is bothered by, though it isn't entirely clear what does make enumeration by cases uh, so dull by Hardy's lights. But I'm inclined to think that it has something to do with what we were talking about before the break, namely that a proof by cases may well not explain why the theorem is true. It doesn't provide the requisite unification that, at least in some cases, we would expect an explanation to supply. And it may be, as Alistair said, that there is no explanation for why 
the theorem is true. There may be no unifying proof. So I want to talk a little bit about the connections between depth and explanation and unification, at least as far as they bear on mathematical cases. And another thing I'd like to try to do is to explore a bit the connection between mathematical depth and mathematical power or importance, uh, which might connect to the forward-looking notion of fruitfulness that Jamie, among others, mentioned. And it also suddenly strikes me that my handout would be much more useful to you if you actually had it. Um, <laughs> so, uh, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Well, I haven't said anything yet, so, um, so that's something anyway. Maybe I should wait a minute. Anyway, that's a rough list of some of the things I'd like to put on the table, even if I, um, my remarks are very brief uh, and I don't come to any real conclusions about any of those topics. So let me uh, start then with my first example, um, which I've chosen because it may well initially appear to epitomize lack of depth. Uh, to see how depth enters into it, I'll present it in a Martin Gardner-esque fashion. So here goes, a bit of mathemagic. Here's a way to amaze your friends, you could imagine Martin Gardner saying. Tell them that you can add numbers much more rapidly than they can, even if they use a calculator. Demonstrate your addition wizardry by asking them to select any two numbers and to insert one in the first row and one in the second row of the blank table that I've put on the handout. Then ask them to fill out the rest of the table by inserting the sum of those first two rows in row three and the sum of rows two and three in row four and the sum of three and four in row five and all the way down through row 10. And finally, to complete the table by summing all of the numbers in rows one through 10. While your friends are furiously filling in the table, you look over their shoulders and wait until they fill in row seven. And then you boldly announce the grand total long before they can reach it. They will be astonished. Just in case you haven't learned anything that you can use on the flight back, uh, here, here you've got something. Uh, I've put on the handout the completed table for the case where the initial numbers are four and seven. Your friends may try having you begin with different numbers, perhaps even with fractions or negative numbers or whatever. And eventually, they'll ask you to divulge your mathematical trick, which is that for any initial two numbers, the grand total equals 11 times the entry in row 7. For instance, in the second table on the handout, the entry in row 7 is 76, and 76 times 11 is 836, the grand total. And even I can multiply 11. In my, by 11 in my head. So the third table on the handout is the one that Martin Gardner uses to prove that for any two initial numbers, x and y, the sum of the 10 rows is 11 times the seventh row. Now this result is much more of a mathematical curiosity than a mathematical fact having any great importance or depth. Nevertheless, one proof of this fact I think, can be deeper than another, though neither of them is particularly deep. Looking at the table used in Martin Gardner's proof, we cannot help but think of the x's and y's as forming separate sequences. We then recognize that the coefficients of the x terms in lines 3 through 10 are the first eight members of the Fibonacci sequence, and that the coefficients of the y terms in lines 2 through 10 are the first nine members of the Fibonacci sequence. Gardner's proof, then, reveals that the results holding on the x side consists of the first equation that I've put at the top of the next page on the handout, that the sum of the first eight Fibonacci numbers plus 1 equals 11 times the fifth Fibonacci number. Right? That's just that the uh, x coefficients for lines 3 through 10 plus the x coefficient for line 1 equals the x coefficient for line 7. And similarly, the results holding on the y side consists 
of the fact that the sum of the first nine Fibonacci numbers equal, equals 11 times the sixth Fibonacci number. So having proved the theorem by using the table filled in with x's and y's, we now find ourselves looking at the original result as having two separate components, an x result and a y result. I don't think we would have looked at it as having two separate components prior to the Martin Gardner proof. And now that we've decomposed the result into x result and y result, we want to know why the, the x sum and the y sum end up having the very same property. Why is it that the x sum works out so that the coefficient in the grand total is 11 times the coefficient on the seventh line, and the y sum also turns out to be like that? Why are the x sum and the y sum alike in this regard? Well, the proof that uses Gardner's table then prompts this y question, but fails to answer it. The y question can be answered by another proof of the very same mathematical fact, a proof that arguably goes a bit deeper. Treat the x coefficients in rows 1 through 10 as 10 successive members of the doubly infinite Fibonacci sequence, and treat the y coefficients in rows 1 through 10 as a different 10-member fragment of the doubly infinite Fibonacci sequence. We can then prove, in a very boring way, but we can prove it, that the sum of any 10 successive members of the Fibonacci sequence is 11 times the seventh member. And I've put a fairly laborious proof on the handout. By laborious, I meant uninteresting. I don't, can't remember whether that was up on the list of terms of art, but laborious doesn't always mean uh, something good. Although the steps of this proof are pretty boring, it seems to me a somewhat deeper proof of the same pretty inconsequential mathematical result. What makes this proof a somewhat deeper piece of mathematics than the earlier proof? Well, there are any number of possible candidates. One possibility is simply that by connecting the result to the Fibonacci sequence, the proof connects the mathematical fact being proved to a lot of other mathematics. But I don't think that's all there is to it. The greater depth here, I'm inclined to suspect, comes from what this connection to the Fibonacci sequence allows the deeper proof to do, that the shallower proof couldn't do. The deeper proof unifies the x side of Gardner's table with the y side showing it to be no coincidence that they're alike in that the coefficient in the grand total is 11 times the coefficient on the seventh line. The two sides turn out to be alike for the same reason, because both the x coefficients and the y coefficients are 10 member fragments of the doubly infinite Fibonacci sequence. And any 10 successive members of that sequence have the property of being 11 times the seventh member. Another related way of thinking about why the second proof is deeper than the first proof, than Gardner's proof, is simply that it answers more why questions than Gardner's proof does. Admittedly, the original proof successfully explains why you were able to get the grand total so rapidly, why the bit of mathematic worked. But Gardner's proof also ends up provoking another why question that it fails to answer. Namely, why the x side and the y side share this property. Is it just a coincidence that they both work out this way? Well, the second proof reveals it to be no coincidence that the x and y sides cooperate in this way. The two sides work in the same way because of another feature that they have in common. Namely, that each one involves the sum of 10 consecutive Fibonacci numbers that the deeper proof gets at least some of its depth by answering why questions that are provoked by, but not answered by, the shallower proof, is kind of like the way that some scientific results count as deeper than others, by supplying deeper scientific explanations, by answering more why questions, especially why questions that are provoked by the shallower explanations that they're deeper than. For example, phenomena involving falling bodies can be explained in classical physics by Galileo's law of falling bodies, but they can be explained more deeply 
by Newton's laws of motion and gravity. Some phenomena involving gases can be explained by the gas laws, but more deeply by statistical mechanics and the kinetic molecular theory of gases. What makes those explanations deeper? Well, I'm not really sure. Presumably, their greater depth has something to do with the fact that they can answer not only the why questions answered by the shallower explanations, but also some more why questions, especially why questions that are prompted by the shallower explanations but left unanswered by them. In classical physics, Newton's laws of motion and gravity explain why Galileo's law of falling bodies holds. And so they can give deeper explanations than Galileo's law can give. Statistical mechanics and the kinetic molecular theory of gases explain why the gas laws hold insofar as they do, and so give deeper explanations than the gas laws provide. The proof that exploits the doubly infinite Fibonacci sequence not only explains why the addition trick succeeded, but also explains why the x and y sides of Gardner's table turn out to work in the very same way. At least that's a thought that I want to put on the table. Of course, there are also lots of differences between the scientific and mathematical examples. Depth in the scientific examples I've just given involves describing causal processes at a more fundamental level, whereas there are no causal processes at work in a purely mathematical case. Nevertheless, both kinds of examples may involve answering more why questions, and in particular, why questions provoked naturally by shallower explanations. In the Martin Gardner, Oh, all right, so end of that thought. Now, in the Martin Gardner example, I've tried to contrast something shallower with something deeper, but I don't mean to suggest that depth always requires shallowness to make it deep, or even to make it recognizable as deep. But I suspect that it's often helpful to have something shallower to compare something deeper to in order to throw its depth into sharper relief. In the Martin Gardner example, what was deeper or shallower was a proof of a given result. In other examples, of course, as we've discussed repeatedly, uh, it can be a theorem that's deep or shallow, or a method that's deep or shallow, or perhaps a concept that's deep or shallow, or a definition. Uh, one of the things we keep running into is how many of these different things uh, can be deep or shallow, and questions about which depth or shallowness is prior to which other depth or shallowness. A deep theorem, I presume, can have other theorems as special cases, and a proof of the deeper or more general theorem, if it's a kind of unified proof that accords a uniform treatment to all of these special cases, uh, can be a deep way of proving that more general theorem and thereby unifying those separate theorems. In contrast to other shallower proofs of those theorems that provide only one or another of them with a proof and so fail to unify them. Let me give you an example of what I'm trying to gesture towards. This is on the next page of the handout. I've put a familiar result concerning expansion in powers and another result concerning expansion in derivatives. The expansion result concerning powers is the familiar binomial theorem, and the expansion result concerning derivatives is just the general rule expressing the nth derivative of a product in terms of the product of the derivatives. As early as 1695, Leibniz noted the striking analogy between these two results. He even argued in a 1697 letter to John Wallace that his notation was better than Newton's because it made this analogy more salient. Johann Bernoulli wrote to Leibniz in 1695, quote, obviously I'm translating here, uh, I'm not, but someone is, um, nothing is more elegant than the agreement you have observed, this analogy I was just gesturing towards, 
Uh, doubtless there is some underlying secret. Now we might think of the underlying secret as something hidden that a deeper theorem would reveal, or also as something hidden in the manner of a common underlying structure that's responsible for the analogy, where talk of responsibility here is to be cashed out in terms of explanation. In fact, of course, the similarity between these two results is no coincidence. It's not, uh, quote, uh, founded on accidental analogy, unquote, as Duncan Gregory put it in 1841. Rather, exponentiation and differentiation are alike in this respect because they're alike in obeying the same three laws of combination, as Gregory called them, what he termed the laws of commutativity, distributivity, and repetition, which I've put on the handout. From the fact that exponentiation obeys these three laws, the binomial theorem follows, and from the fact that differentiation obeys them, the product rule follows in mathematically the same way. And this is what led Gregory to say that both of these results, quote, depend only on the laws of combination to which the symbols are subject and are therefore true of all symbols, whatever their nature may be, which are subject to the same laws of combination, unquote. So there's a deep analogy between these two operations that's responsible for the observed analogy between the two expansion results. So we have a deepish result that any operation subject to these laws of combination obeys an analog of the binomial theorem. Of course, today we'd say that the binomial theorem in this broad sense holds in any commutative group, uh, ring. So what makes this result deep-ish? After this morning's talk where virtually nothing was deep, I feel uneasy about saying that anything is deep. But this seems pretty deep. Well, part of what makes this result deep, I suppose, is that it reveals a similarity at a very abstract level between two apparently quite distinct operations. It shows how the two separate expansion theorems can be generalized. And the general theorem has the two separate expansions as special cases. Perhaps another contributor to the result's depth has to do with explanation. Exponentiation and differentiation obey the same laws of expansion precisely because they obey the same three laws of combination. What's responsible for an operation's obeying the given law of expansion is just that it obeys the three laws of combination. No further details of the operation are responsible. As Francois Joseph Servois said regarding the way in which the laws of combination explain the analogy between the two expansions, quote, it's necessary to find the cause and then everything is very happily explained, unquote. Yeah, he, he says cause, not just because. That the two operations obey the same laws of combination is, he said, the true origin, la véritable origine, excuse me, of the analogy between the two results. Separate, unrelated derivations of the two results could prove them, but would not explain why they hold, it seems. Regarding the analogy deployed to solve a linear differential equation, by solving an algebraic equation and then exchanging powers for derivatives, Boole wrote, this is a longish quote, the analogy is very remarkable, and unless we employed a method of solution common to both problems, it would not be easy to see the reason for so close a resemblance in the solution of two different kinds of equations. The reason, the explanation, the reason why. I'm going to go back to the quote now. It would not be easy to see the reason for so close a resemblance in the solution of two different kinds of equations. But the process which I have here exhibited shows that the form of the solution depends, again, a not causal notion of depends, but some sort of explanatory responsibility notion of depends, 
uh, he didn't say that, of course, uh, that the form of the solution depends solely on processes which are common to the two operations under consideration, being founded only on the common laws of the combination of the symbols, unquote. So the proof of the differentiation expansion theorem from the three laws of combination arguably provides a deeper explanation than its proof from premises that concerned only differentiation. And that greater depth may come partly from the fact that the proof exploits a structure that also explains the similarity between the differentiation and exponentiation expansion theorems. Structure is another notion that has come up from time to time over the course of the last two days. Now that whole mass of ideas uh, that I have just mentioned in connection with the, uh, the two expansion theorems is a combination of ideas for which there are scientific analogs. There are cases of scientific depth that work in pretty much the same way, where there's a common structure that explains a similarity between two otherwise utterly unrelated phenomena. And so this explanation purchases its depth by answering a why question that separate explanations of the two phenomena could not correctly answer. For example, the analogies discovered primarily by William Thomson between certain derivative laws in electrostatics and hydrodynamics and thermodynamics, uh, analogies that Maxwell called physical analogies, these can be explained by the mathematical isomorphism between the fundamental equations of these different areas. By the isomorphism here, I mean electrical potential difference and temperature difference and pressure, for example, playing analogous roles in fundamental laws, or at least laws that are more fundamental than the ones that are being explained. That kind of similarity in the fundamental laws provides a deeper understanding of the analogy between the derivative laws in electrostatics and hydrodynamics, for example. A deeper understanding than would be provided by separate derivations of those derivative laws from their respective more fundamental laws, separate derivations in electrostatics and hydrodynamics, for instance. So there's a common underlying mathematical architecture in these cases, and it's responsible for the derivative laws taking the same form in each of them. In view of that common underlying structure, it's no mathematical coincidence that the derivative laws are analogous. So that's supposed to be a case that in science, in connection with scientific explanation and coincidence and depth and structure, is supposed to be like the mathematical example that I gave a few minutes ago. There are many other mathematical examples where depth seems to come from roughly the same factors as it does when the laws of combination unify the two expansion theorems. One example is where projective geometry uses points and lines at infinity to unify results that in Euclidean geometry have no common proof. The same applies to the way that complex numbers provide a deeper understanding or insight into or explanation of the convergence behaviors of various sequences of real numbers, allowing apparently very dissimilar sequences to have something in common that results in their having similar convergence behavior. The similarity in their convergence behavior is thereby revealed to be no coincidence, but rather to result from an underlying similarity that's visible only on the complex plane. We've wondered over the course of the last two days whether there's a connection between deeper and shallower proofs of a given theorem and deeper and shallower theorems. The theorem involving the Martin Gardner trick, as I've said, strikes me as pretty darn shallow. The expansion theorem strikes me as somewhat deeper. I've tried to suggest that there can be deeper and shallower proofs, both of deeper results and of shallower results. Do deep theorems have at least one deep proof? Is one of these notions of depth more fundamental, I almost said deeper, uh, than the other? 
Well, I don't really know. If a deepish result doesn't have a deepish proof itself, maybe it has to at least figure in many other deep proofs of other results, or at least be a special case of a result that figures in many deep proofs of many other results. I'll come back to a little bit of that at the, at the end, which won't be, won't be long from now. Um, the proof of the differentiation theorem from the three laws of combination seems to me deeper than a separate proof that can't be generalized. The depth of the proof seems related somehow to the depth of the theorem that any operation satisfying the three laws of combination has such an expansion theorem. The depth of the theorem, in turn, may have something to do with its generality in exploiting an important abstract structure common to many otherwise disparate operations. In contrast, in the Martin Gardner mathematical trick example, the depth of the proof involving the doubly infinite Fibonacci sequence is apparently not as directly connected to the depth of any corresponding theorem, since the theorem is just a bit of recreational mathematics. So I wonder whether there's a distinction to be drawn along these lines between, uh, for lack of a better terminology, I'll call deep depth and shallow depth. Where there's deep depth, there's a theorem that would repay further study or an underlying structure that should itself become an object of mathematical investigation. But where there's shallow depth, or only shallow depth, there's a more explanatory proof, a deeper proof, but not a theorem that generalizes the result being proved or suggests a richer context in which to place it that would repay further investigation. Depth and generality often appear to be linked in science as well. For instance, symmetry principles and conservation laws are commonly identified as both extremely general and extremely deep. Steven Weinberg famously remarks that, quote, the symmetry group of nature is the deepest thing that we can understand about nature today." Unquote. That seems at least partly associated with the generality of symmetries and conservation laws. For instance, conservation laws seem to have been recognized as having considerable depth just when they were discovered to be associated with space-time symmetries, and hence to be so general that they could be applicable even outside of the original dynamical theory in which they were first found, namely classical physics. And so they could survive even that theory's demise. Let me switch gears a bit. I said I wanted to say a few things about whether there's a relation between a theorem being deep and the idea of a theorem being mathematically powerful or important. Here I don't mean that the theorem is useful for many practical applications or scientific applications, uh, but rather that the theorem is mathematically useful. Roughly speaking, that it's useful in proving, or perhaps in explaining, a wide variety of other results or perhaps that it's useful in having a wide variety of extensions or generalizations or analogs or abstractions or something like that in a wide variety of mathematical domains. So obviously I'm not at all sure what power or importance in mathematics amounts to precisely, uh, but I do think that mathematicians care about revealing whether or not various results are powerful or important. And interestingly, when they discover that a result is important, its importance can itself become a fact that is demanding and even receiving an explanation. That a result is important is a fact that itself could be important. Mathematicians want to know why it turns out to be such an important result. They want to understand where its power comes from. In some cases, at least, an account of why the result is so powerful amounts to a proof of the result 
that reveals how it follows from premises that are themselves powerful and powerful independent of this particular result. A result's importance or depth or power can be especially mysterious when the result is shown to follow from mathematical premises that seem to hold no particular importance or depth or power. As an example, take Cauchy's inequality, which I've put on the handout. Well, here we have Hardy again. Hardy, Littlewood, and Polya characterize Cauchy's inequality as, quote, very important, unquote. Michael Steele says about it, in a book devoted entirely to it, quote, there is no doubt that this is one of the most widely used and most important inequalities in all of mathematics. A central aim of this book is to suggest a path to mastery of this inequality, its many extensions and its many applications. He means mathematical applications. From the most basic to the most sublime, unquote. I don't think sublime was on the list of terms from this morning, was it? It should be way down at the bottom, I'm assuming. <coughs> Well, having said that, early on in his book, Steele uses mathematical induction to prove Cauchy's inequality. And his proof takes the trajectory that I've put in very abbreviated form next on the handout. This provokes Steele to remark, quote, one might rightly wonder how so much value can be drawn from a bound which comes from the trivial observation that x minus y quantity squared is greater than or equal to zero, unquote. In other words, Steele is asking why Cauchy's inequality is so powerful, perhaps so deep. In other words, he's, he's asking not for what makes it so important, not for what constitutes its importance, what, a, what these are supposed to answer with regard to depth, I mean. And he's not asking what the consequences of its importance are. He's asking for an explanation, a reason why it's so important. Why, he's asking for a proof that reveals where in the world its importance could have come from, what's responsible for its importance. Well, eventually, Steele answers his question, at least to his own satisfaction, by pointing out that the inequality that he used to prove Cauchy's inequality effectively says that among all rectangles of a given area, the square has the smallest perimeter. And this is a deep result, he says. He concludes his explanation by saying, so here's the, the climax of the the answer to the why question, a why question about importance or, or power or, or maybe depth. Quote, we now see more clearly why x squared over 2 plus y squared over 2 is greater than xy might be powerful. It's part of that great stream of results that links symmetry and optimality. Unquote. So here we have an explanation of why one result turns out to be so deep or powerful or important in terms of the depth or power or importance of another result from which it follows. Well, let me close with one last comment. This one about what I called a few minutes ago shallow depth, where there's no deep theorem, but there are deeper and shallower proofs or methods or strategies to prove the given theorem where perhaps the deeper proof or method or strategy purchases its depth by answering why questions that are raised but left unanswered by the shallower way. Inspired by Martin Gardner's mathematical trick, I'm wondering whether this sort of contrast between depth and shallowness arises fairly often when mathematical tricks are used to solve certain mathematical problems. A shallow solution merely exploits the trick, but leaves us wondering why the trick works, whereas a deeper solution gives us some motivation behind the trick or explanation for the trick. A deeper solution reveals that the trick didn't just happen accidentally to pay off, so that it wasn't really a trick in the pejorative sense, 
at all. A problem may not be deep, we're talking about shallow depth here, but one solution of it can still be deeper than another. And I've tried to give an example, and this is my last example, um, at the very end of the handout. So here's the example. For instance, as, uh, as Jamie has written, uh, sometimes a pesky integral, and I've put a pesky integral on the handout, um, succumbs to a clever substitution. And I've put such a clever change of variables on the handout and shown that it allows the pesky integral to be solved. But such a clever change of variables might well leave us wondering why in the world anyone would have thought about doing that. Why anyone would have thought that that would be useful. I know that that's what I often thought when I was in classes where the professor would say, well, I guess none of you ever thought of trying that on your homework. You could have saved yourself a lot of trouble if you had tried that. And we're all wondering, well, where in the world did he get that from? Well, I put it, I put the point epistemically, but of course I don't really mean to put the point epistemically. What I meant is something more like, why does doing that turn out to be so useful, so helpful in a case like this? If we if we knew why it was so useful, now the epistemic payoff, then that knowledge would presumably have allowed us to predict in advance that it would turn out to be useful. So in the example on the handout, the reason that the tricky, not so tricky when you understand it, uh, the reason why the substitution turns out to be useful is that, well, um, in the example on the handout, for any value of m, over the given domain of integration, the function being integrated is symmetric about the point in the middle of the figure, the point at pi over 4, 1 half. And the figure illustrates this for two values of m, two rather different values of m, as it turns out. So the clever, which I take to be sort of synonymous with tricky, uh, the clever change of variables just flips the function left to right within the rectangle that's marked out by the function over the domain of integration. And so it allows the symmetry of the curve across the rectangle's midpoint uh, to be exploited. Well, that's a slightly deeper way, though this is hardly deep mathematics, that's a slightly deeper way of looking at the change of variables, that it exploits the function's symmetry. Of course, this isn't deep depth. It doesn't leave us with a theorem that identifies the result being proved as a special case of some broader theorem that creates unity among apparent diversity by revealing some abstract explanatory structure that's common to many cases beyond the one that's the subject of the proof. It's not like the expansion case that I mentioned. It doesn't leave us with an abstract structure that's itself worthy of further mathematical investigation, or at least if it does, we never got to it in the class that I was just alluding to. All right, well, I'll stop there, and I'll be glad to hear what you would like to ask about. Uh, I'd like to say that I really welcome the idea of considering the concept of deeper than rather than absolute depth. I think that might very well be an easier concept to understand, just as it's easier to understand one number being larger than a number, <laughs> another, rather than absolutely large. Um, and, and you've given some, uh, some criteria for one thing to be deeper than another. And I, like, I like this approach. Incidentally, the word sublime, I think Gauss uses that. Um, I don't know whether anybody else can recall. I think I've seen it somewhere, but I don't recall where. <coughs> uh, <laughs> we, think, we think we've seen it, but we don't recall where. I guess it was utterly convincing. Huh? <laughs> yeah, I guess, well, following up on that, I think if Jeremy Ice can correct me if, if I've got this wrong, but uh, Kant's analysis of, of judgments of the sublime are that they're judgments of things which are essentially so great you can't take them in. Mm -hmm. They're so, you know, sort of surpass the powers of, 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 of imagination to reproduce. That might be even more than very deep. This is in the neighborhood of awesome in its yes. original sense, um, yes, yes. and all that good romantic stuff. <laughs>
so you talk about the uh, unifying nature of deeper depth, but also some of the explanatory uh, component of it. And so I'd just be curious the extent to which you think it lines up with the number one that we've generated so far earlier, or whether that's importantly different than what you have in mind with deeper depth. Well, I think there are lots of ways of, <clears throat> excuse me, lots of ways of tying together disparate fields that don't necessarily involve explanation, per se. Um, I try to um, sort of bring explanation into the fold by talking about common underlying structures and common proofs and stuff like that. I'm not saying that that's necessary for deeper depth. This is a choice point. But tying together disparate fields can mean any number of possible things. Uh, finding some common structure that's responsible for analogies between the disparate fields is a more specific idea. So two apparently disparate fields can be tied together by finding that the resources of this one can be used to prove this theorem, and the resources of that one could also be used to prove this theorem. Or they could be tied together because the theorem has fruitful applications in this field and fruitful applications in that field. Um, neither of those ways of tying together necessarily leads to tying together via common underlying structures that supply the, 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 um, the architecture that's responsible for analogies between the two fields. There might not even be apparent analogies between the two fields, and yet the two fields can be tied together uh, via a deep result. So I guess the answer to your question is this can be interpreted in lots of different ways. I imagine that what I said could be interpreted in lots of different ways too, but they're not the same different ways. At least one of them, yeah. And the way you describe it, it, it sounds like basically algebraic thinking, right? You want to find the abstract structure that, that these things have in common. And that's really sort of what abstract algebra is about. Well, certainly in the example I gave, that's mm -hmm. what was going on. I'm not yeah. committed to common underlying structures always having to be algebraic in, well, I'm not sure exactly what the scope of algebraic here is, yeah. but. It just strikes me as a very algebraic way of thinking. Yeah. Shared structure, and then we'll be able to understand why these same things are happening in different places because they're all roofs. They're all <laughs> right. I mean, I mean, I, as I said, I have this analogy between this phenomenon in <laughs> mathematics yeah. and depth and explanation and unification and so forth, and similar phenomena in science. Yeah, but in the scientific case, it does seem a little bit different. You have the single differential equation or something that looks right. like all these different guys. Exactly. I mean, at least in the example I gave, uh, there's a kind of common mathematical structure to the relevant laws, for example. But I don't know that the structure has to be like that in order for there to be a common structure. So, you mean whether it has to be mathematical? Whether it has to be mathematical, yeah. Yeah, I was wondering that too, whether you made an example. I tried to find a scientific example that was arguably reasonably close in the way it worked to the mathematical example that I had chosen. But the idea of finding common structures that are responsible for analogies among physically distinct phenomena is a much more general idea than that. And by physically distinct phenomena, of course, nobody thinks that electric fields are made of water or something like that. I'm curious about how you're thinking about explanation here um, in connection with the discussion that's sort of come up a few times about uh, um, objectiveness and these notions of depth. I mean, maybe a question about your sort of prior thoughts on scientific explanation. I mean, do you tend to think of scientific explanations as sort of things in the world, or do you think of them as somehow aspects of scientific practice, things that we come up with? Well, that's a that's a big question. Uh, yeah, um, well, and whatever the answer is, then one could ask about explanation in mathematics right. the same way. Well, I, I mean, 
the short answer is uh, I do think that there are lots of objective sorts of features of scientific explanations, that there are relations of explanatorily prior to and explanatorily posterior to that are matters of fact. That being said, there are all sorts of context sensitivities and interest relativities that go into posing why questions, some of which are very familiar from the scientific explanation literature. You know, if you're asking for a causal explanation, you know, do you want a proximate cause or a distant cause? Do you want the, you know, is it the, the shape of the road that was the cause of the accident? Or is it the careless driving or the weather conditions or the Big Bang? Or, you know, they're all causes, right? But some of them are typically totally irrelevant. And those are all interesting, pragmatic features of asking about why the accident took place. But you can prescind from them, abstract from them, and you're left with objective relations of dependence of some kind or other, causal dependence in the case I just mentioned. It's not causal dependence in the relation between symmetry principles and conservation laws, since neither of them is caused by anything. So I'm, I'm not sure what sort of answer that is. It's, there's lots of objective dependence of various kinds in the world, causal dependence being one kind. And there are lots of pragmatic, contextual, interest, relative factors that go into posing and answering why questions. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, I, I'm happy to talk more. I just don't know whether no, no, that's no, no, the level so of generality that you want. One about, about your views. I mean, so I'm, I'm... Well, I think there are lots of different kinds of scientific explanations. There are causal explanations and dimensional explanations. And there are various kinds of nomological explanations. There are distinctively mathematical scientific explanations and others that use math in the, as it were, usual sort of way. Um, there are symmetry type explanations. There are a whole lot of different kinds of scientific explanations, in my view. And while there's, to take a page from the previous talk, a family resemblance among them, a lot of them eliminate coincidences, for example, and supply understanding and insight and all that good stuff. Uh, I don't think there's sort of a single overarching notion of what a scientific explanation is and how everything else is in the subscripts. Um, I, I certainly agree with that, but um, I'm curious then about how much, um, you know, so, so to, to, what, to what extent are we saying, or are, or are you saying when you say that, um, uh, that in, in many cases the deeper proof is the one that provides or has more explanatory power, um, that, that that's just stepping back to, to an idea about the insightful proof that, that's come up a few times, or if mm -hmm. some, something, uh, if you had a picture of explanation on which uh, it would be different to say that a, a proof was explanatory than to say it provided an insight? Well, I don't have any fine-grained distinction in mind between being explanatory, providing insight, providing understanding. Uh, uh, maybe I'm just ham-fisted about this, but I'm inclined to run those together and see them all as getting at more or less the same idea, whether it's in science or in mathematics. But I agree that insofar as I pushed the notion of depth towards the idea of explanation or insight or understanding or whatever this is, I'm really kind of obliged to say something more constructive about what the heck it takes for a proof to supply any of these good things. And you know, what can I say? I have a story about that, too. Uh, <laughs> if you want to read it, it's going to come out in October, at least uh, my best shot at giving it in some reasonably small, short, digestible form. So I also think that mathematic, explanation in mathematics has pragmatic, psychological, <laughs> human-related, interest-related elements, but that there are also features of getting it right whatever mathematical reality amounts to. You know, those, uh, 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 if something is thought to be a co mathematical coincidence and then turns out not to be, that's not just a matter of us and our psychology, that's a discovery about, you know, the mathematical world, whatever it is that makes mathematical truths true. Well, so there are both elements there as well, on my view. Presumably the discovery is something about us. It's the thing that's... Discovered. What's discovered is a fact about yeah, right. the mathematical world. 
talking about this. Um, do you also think that there's a relation of more explanatory then, in the same way that there's a relation of deeper then? Um, yeah. I mean, that, that's well, a, I that's tried to suggest. I'm, I'm no, no, it's a, I tried to suggest one dimension along which explanations can be compared, and one can be judged more explanatory than the other, namely answering why, more why questions than, in particular, why questions that are provoked by the other explanation. Is that the only dimension along which explanations can be compared such that one is more explanatory than the other? No, I don't think so. It's nice if two explanations tie in every other respect in which they can be compared, but one explains more than the other. Um, I don't know that it always has to work out that way. But that was the easiest one to point to uh, for my purposes, namely uh, explaining the explainers in the, the shallower explanation. Because there are scientific analogs to that and seemingly mathematical cases. Uh, yes, Jeremy. Oh, sorry. I, am I doing it or are you? No, 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 I, I, was just, I was looking this way and there were a blind spot. So I, I'm doing it, but I. <laughs> I, I just wanted to follow up on, on, on Jeremy's question and your answer to it. Um, I was wondering, um, it seems like uh, sort of intuitively I would think that uh, certain, the answer, well, right, the answer to the certain why questions are deeper than others. Um, at least that's my sense of it. Um, in which case, it seems like sort of counting up would be the, the like numbers of why questions answered might not not uh, give quite the right results because you might end up saying like oh well, we found it's like 24 why questions that this group answers um, but they're all really boring why questions mm -hmm. um, whereas like this one group only answers 12 but um, you know this particular one that it answers has is much much deeper than um, or the answer is much deeper I guess. I'm having trouble sort of figuring out to which thing to attach the depth. <laughs> right. I, I wasn't suggesting that you simply count them up and treat yeah, yeah, them all yeah. equally. Right. Um, yeah, in the examples <laughs> that came up here, I was, I was trying to craft them in such a way that the, the deeper proof answers, as it were, all the why questions that the shallower proof answers plus more. I think that's what's going on in the Martin Gardner example, for instance, yeah. where the, the theorem is strikingly shallow. But, and the proofs aren't all that deep either, but there's one that answers a why question that's provoked by but not answered by the other proof. And it answers the other why. I mean, there are only two why questions that are on the table in this case. Why does the trick work or work for such a wide range of numbers, I suppose? And then well, why does the x half fit so nicely with the y half so as to make the trick work? Yeah, so since there are only two and one answers one and the other answers two, I'm in the clear. Um, <laughs> but I don't think that they're all going to work out that way. Right. Um, so, like, clearly, supersets uh, make for a better. <laughs> right. Um, and I don't know that they, I mean, I don't see any reason why we should be worried that they don't work out this way, because there are going to be, in particular contexts, only certain sorts of why questions that we're particularly interested in. And in those contexts, we'll be able to say, this one is a deeper explanation than that one. And then in other contexts, there'll be a whole mishmash of why questions that are out there. and. We know that there are plenty others that we just haven't thought of yet, but that we'd be interested in if we thought of them. And then there won't be any univocal answer to which one is deeper. There'll be okay. some that answer some why questions and others that answer others. And we, go, we get along talking to each other in terms of depth, but it's okay. very localized. Yeah, because I was going to sort of bring up the uh, grumblings about incomparabilities that I sort of heard percolating from, from over the from over that way. I'm not sure whose they were, but they were grumbling. I couldn't hear. <laughs> I think they were um, during the break earlier. Um, but yeah, so that, that seems good. If it's, it's just going to be the case that there are points that we won't actually be able to say um, x proof is deeper than y proof. I don't think that this is any, de any different than what goes on on the scientific side with yeah, depth. That's, that's right. And that's been my theme, really, is to take the questions about depth and the mathematical side and kind of take a sidewards glance over to the scientific side and see whether there's any insight we can gain from that direction. I think that's really helpful for Sure. So, so there are sort of two distinctive things about the way that you're approaching the question of mathematical depth. One is to look at the relationship between depth and depth. <laughs> Freudian slip there. Depth, sin, and, you know, depth, and 
superficially a, a phenomenon of apothesis, which is in the case of science, you tend much more often to talk about explanation and rarely to talk about depth. Right? There's a large field on what scientific explanation is, but very small field on what scientific depth is. Oh, so you didn't mean me particularly. You meant sort of we, we all. Yeah, we, we, we as in general. So you think in science, you're, you're much more, if you could say, which more important in science, depth or explanation, you would say, oh, explanation. And you would talk about depth, but not in the same way. Whereas in the case of mathematics, it seems like depth sometimes has the function of the highest honor. <coughs> much, has a much more central role, role than explanation does in mathematics. Um, and I'm wondering if, if you think that there's anything to this, whether I'm all wet in thinking there is this disanalogy. Uh, and if there is such a disanalogy, whether you think there's is anything more than just a trivial linguistic practice of the two fields, or do you think it says something significant about the differences between math and science? Well, I'd have to think about that more than I'm going to right now, to be <laughs> sure. <laughs> my initial, uh, my initial inclination, is to think that um, we talk about depth more in science than I think you're giving scientists credit for, to begin with. Um, philosophers don't talk about depth, explanatory depth, that much. There's a famous book, or a book, on explanation called Depth by Michael Strevens, and there are some papers by Hitchcock and Woodward about explanatory depth, in science, I mean. But the scientific explanation, um, uh, what should we call it, uh, literature, talks a lot more about what's an explanation and what isn't than about what's a better explanation and what's a shallower explanation. By better, I didn't mean as an in inference to the best explanation better. I meant deeper uh, or shallower. I think that's an unfortunate feature of the literature. I don't think that's a feature of science. I think, well, I gave some examples, at least a couple of examples, of greater and lesser explanatory depth in science. And I think there are a lot of other examples that are rather different from the ones that I just gave, but also where terms like depth are very naturally applied. So for example, to choose an example that is in the um, philosophical literature, take my teacher, my sainted teacher, Wes Salmon's famous friendly physicist case, where you've got the physicist in the airplane, and the airplane is taxiing for takeoff, and the helium balloon is in the airplane, and as the airplane taxis, the helium balloon moves toward the front of the cabin, and there are two different compatible explanations of this fact, one of which is arguably deeper than the other, one having to do with general relativity, and the other having to do with um, pressure and inertia. So that's a different kind of depth, but I think there's a lot of depth in, or differences of depth in scientific explanation that philosophers haven't been talking that much about because they've mostly been talking about, you know, the difference between explaining the length of the shadow by the height of the flagpole and deducing the height of the flagpole from the length of the shadow, but not explaining it. That's not a difference of depth. That's a difference of it explains, it doesn't explain. Uh, on the mathematical side, well, there the story is somewhat different. Some philosophers seem to think that mathematicians talk quite a bit about explanation. It's just that philosophers haven't been paying that much attention. Other philosophers seem to think that mathematicians almost never talk about explanation, uh, although they talk about other things that may be related to explanation. For instance, I mentioned the notion of a mathematical coincidence. It may be that in lots of cases one can find references to, is that coincidental or not in the mathematical literature? and a whole discussion about that without the word explanation coming up at all. But my own attitude would be that talk of explanation is buried within talk of coincidentalness. That's a, you know, that's my view. So that's a kind of linguistic artifact of the form of life of mathematics. I'm not really qualified to know how much mathematicians talk about explanation. I'm always on the lookout for examples, but that's going to bias me in thinking about how many there are. Okay. Um. Yeah, on, uh, my sense is that mathematicians talk a great deal about explanation, and that that's one of the higher values in, in any proof, is it's an explanatory proof. Mm -hmm. and, and one will generally trade in an elegant proof for an explanatory proof, even though you sort of value the elegant proof too, but the explanatory proof is really what, what one wants, because what you're looking for is explanation, trying to understand the phenomenon, and so, um, yeah, I, I mean, it, but it doesn't, a lot of things that mathematicians talk about don't get in print, 
the, 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 you print the statement in the theorem and the, the, the why is this relevant to something, but you don't actually say this is a better explanation than that, uh, nearly so much as you say it when you're giving a talk uh, at a colloquium. Um, well, it would help me out no end if mathematicians were a little more forthcoming about this. <laughs> um, All you have to do is ask. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the one, the one thing I would say is that even though I was, you know, pressing pretty hard on the importance of explanation and explanatory proofs in mathematics, I don't mean to suggest for a minute that explanatoriness, and I'm sure you weren't suggesting this either, that explanatoriness is the only virtue that a proof can have or the, the most important virtue that a proof can have or anything like that. Um, you know, there are a whole lot of different plus points that a proof can have. You mentioned elegance and beauty. Visualizability is one. Explanatoriness is one. There are all sorts. Uh, concision is one. Um, purity is I mean, there are a whole bunch of ones. Well, and I don't. You, your, your example is actually an excellent illustration of what we're talking about, right? I mean, the first proof is very elegant, I would say, but the picture explains the proof. Mm -hmm. So I mean, this is, you know. <laughs> I, I mean, I think that, that actually that explanation is probably all of those things are components of what makes a good proof, but that almost always explanatory, explanatory value trumps anything else in mathematics. Not necessarily. I mean, I think these two things, I mean, both are extremely valuable. Right? I mean, the first thing is a short, elegant proof, but it yeah. doesn't really explain anything. And the second proof you know, explains things, but on the other hand, you know, you need a picture for it. So both proofs have, have their <laughs> virtues. I mean, this takes us back to the very first question, which was about the meaning behind this idea. A proof could tie together disparate fields without supplying explanation, and it could be valuable for tying together the disparate fields. And then another proof that's explanatory and perhaps purer, not that those inevitably go together, um, could be terrifically valuable for that. I, I'm much more interested in understanding what explanation is than somehow imperialistically conquering all these virtues by boiling them all down to explanatory power. So one of my thoughts here was that lots of the ideas that are up on the board were very like someone like Kitcher's ideas about explanation anyway. But you're, you're now really drawing the line with that your notion of mathematical explanation is not explanation by unification. Correct. I mean, I gave, some, I gave some examples where proofs seem to derive some explanatory power by virtue of unifying. But it's definitely not my view that all cases of proofs that explain derive their explanatory power by virtue of the unification that they achieve. And Kitcher's view, of course, is that they all do. And not just explanations in mathematics, but scientific explanations all derive their explanatory power by the unification. It's a very unifying sort of view uh, <laughs> of unification. But I, I don't, that's not my view. Mm-hmm. 